Hello there. In this video, I'm going to do another review of a Finercy multifunctional device. This time it's going to be the Finercy 2C53P, which is a multifunction 3 in 1, 50 megahertz, two channel oscilloscope, 20,000 count multimeter, and 10 megahertz signal generator. Now, what I thought I would do, I would split the video into two. Um, and in this first video, I'm going to do a basic overview, teardown, hardware review, a sample rate test, and a basic bandwidth test. Then I'm going to use it for a couple of weeks, uh, see what it's like to really use. Um, I'm going to take it with me to work um, and then use it on the job um, and get a really uh, good look and feel for it rather than just take an academic or a specification type approach. Then I'm also, at the same time, hopefully going to let Federsi fix any software bugs along the way um, and see what other things people are saying about it, because I'm sure there's going to be other reviews coming out. Uh, and then I'll make my second video, which is going to focus on the performance and functionality, where we'll, dig, we'll, we'll uh, have a bit of a deep dive on some of the performance areas and functionality areas. So please let me know what you'd like uh, to see in this performance video. Uh, let me know in the comments um, any particular things you'd like to see tested or would you like to see a comparison between this device and uh, other devices. Please also note that I bought this device myself and I'm not affiliated with Finerus in any way and I'm not receiving any benefits from them. Now a note about the software loaded into this device that I'll be using during this review. So it's application version 1.5 and FPGA version 1.4 um, as shown in the dotted version history. Now you'll note this is not the latest version. Um, I'm not going to bother trying to update this until I do the second video with the functional review. Um, so there may well be some bugs in here that you'll witness as we do the review um, but uh, check back to see what the latest version is when you watch this video these issues may have well been resolved. Now if you're in the need to have some PCBs prototyped or perhaps to have some 3D printing done or even to have some CNC machining done then check out the sponsor of today's video PCBWay. They have a vast range of PCB manufacturing options available, low prices and fast delivery times. For more details, go to pcbway.com or follow the link in the description. Now let's have a look at the specs and see what's notable and interesting. First of all, it's got a nice large uh, touchscreen, 4.3 inches uh, with a uh, resolution of 480 by 272 and it has a tempered glass screen um, so hopefully it's, it's durable the power supply is USB-C 5 volts 2 amps unfortunately it doesn't have a, a USB-C PD or fast charging it's got a huge battery 4000 milliamp hour I guess that's to power the, the large screen good range of languages um, multimeter, nothing really to write home about. I do note that it's got 20,000 counts, but um, it's got exactly the same specification as its um, cousin, the 2C23T, um, and also the DMT99 multimeter. Um, it does actually use the same chipset. So even though you've got more counts, the accuracy is the same. So what's the point? So here's some interesting stuff, the oscilloscope parameters or specs. So it says it's got a real-time sampling rate of 250 mega samples per second, uh, time based down to 10 nanoseconds, and it's got XY, yay, at last. Remember the uh, 2C23T didn't, unfortunately. Um, what else is notable? Storage space of 13M, M watt. It's got a storage depth up to 64 kilobyte, which I guess is the same as kilopoint points because it's an 8-bit scope. Um, and it's that's not as much as I would have thought, actually. 
And I know it's got an improved vertical sensitivity over the 20, uh, 2C23T. Remember that was uh, 20 millivolts, which is a bit of a, a showstopper for some. So this is at least 10 millivolts, so that's an improvement. Um, and it's got a switchable bandwidth limit uh, down to 20 megahertz. That's nice to have. Uh, 50 megahertz analog bandwidth, of course. And one thing I notice it doesn't state here is about the mathematical functions or FFT. Uh, so it's got a few interesting functions there that we can test in the next video. Um, other than that, I think that about sums up the interesting things about the oscilloscope. And finally, the signal generator uh, can output a sine wave up to 10 megahertz. Um, and all other waveforms, which we'll look at later, at 5. So I paid around uh, 106, 110 USD for this, or equivalent of, something like that. That's delivered. I bought it off AliExpress. Um, and I think that it took about a week to be delivered. So it was, it was pretty good. Uh, but at that price point, it's a little bit pricey actually. Um, there's quite a lot of competition now, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, for these multi-function uh, oscilloscope meters um, with similar bandwidths. Um, in fact, you know, there's a few devices, uh, handheld devices, around of 80 megahertz, um, which uh, are cheaper than this. So. Uh, Okay, you've got true RMS, as shown on the box there, intelligent burning, whatever that means. Okay, you see there it's a FPGA plus MCU plus A to D. Okay, yeah, signal generator, 10 megahertz, 4.5 digits, 20 count, RMS, multimeter. What else have we got on the box? 2 times 50 megahertz. Nicely packaged, as usual. Now part of me kind of feeling bad with all the packaging that comes with some of this stuff. I don't mind if it's, it's cardboard, but look at the amount of plastic. It's been, it's, there's no need to use a big foam block. They could use cardboard, I'm sure. Uh, the manual is it's actually fairly brief considering all the functionality that this has got. And it's in a lot of languages, but um, the, the, the translations, at least to English, is pretty good. It's quite heavy, this. That would be the 4,000 milliamp hour battery to power that big display, I guess. Nicely uh, packed for freshness, a nice uh, soft feel bag. Uh, it feels, feels sturdy. It's got nice uh, power button which is in, not raised, that's good. Let's take this screen protector off. Whoa, that's shiny. I don't really like such shiny screens I prefer to kind of have a matte look it's got touch buttons at the bottom okay four meter input jacks on the side doesn't tell you how many milliamps oh no oh no it's got nice BNC inputs for the oscilloscope but look it's got one of those what is it MCX connectors for the signal generator oh I don't like those actually I didn't think it would be too much of a problem when I saw them being used on the DSO TC3, but I had some bad experiences. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Nice sturdy uh, support, flip out support at the back. Hmm. Let's see what else we've got under this plastic block. Okay, your oscilloscope probe. It should be at least 100 megahertz. I hope. Mm, let's have a look. I hope they are. 
I've got two, that's good. I was expecting one. That's good. Not often you get more than you're expecting. Yep, 100 megahertz. That's great. So that's that the 6100 model. Just check the spec. So 6100. Okay, so you've got 10 megahertz in times one and 100 megahertz in times 10. So if you want that full bandwidth, make sure you've got it switched to 10x. Uh, these look exactly the same as the the probes used or supplied to the DMT-99 and the 2C23T. They're pretty good actually, I quite like them. Uh, they're rated at 20 amps, which I don't believe. Um, but they're quite flexible and super, super sharp. No complaints there really, they're not bad. Okay, and then a crop clip to the horrible, what is it, MCX connector. Yeah, so I I had one of this on my DSO TC3, and it, they all these outer leaves snapped off. I'll show you that later. You see how easy those leaves come out? A bit of use, and they fall off, and your probe will be useless. And last but not least, USB charging cable, which should be USB and data power and data of course. Now let's have a, a closer look around this. Um, yeah so I said I was going to tell you a bit more about this connector. Uh, let me just show you we've got the same connections on the DSO TC3 and initially I thought they weren't too bad but have a look at what's left of my original MCX connector cable. You see all those outer leaves have disappeared, they all snapped off and annoyingly they actually snapped off inside the, the socket and I had to try and get them out with tweezers. Let me just show you this with the, the new lead for comparison so you see what I mean. So here they are together. So I really don't like them. Why they couldn't have used uh, you see how they snapped off? Well, they couldn't have used a BNC. I guess they didn't have any room inside, uh, which I guess we'll find out later. What a shame. Um, as we so, yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 actually very sturdy. It's a bit of a brick. It's got nice rubber bumpers on the corners. That's good. I like that. And it feels quite quite nice. Uh, actually, all of Finerasi products, the construction, the finishing is quite nice. The um, the power buttons recess. That's nice. Um, a lot of multimeters uh, or scope meters, I should say, uh, including this one here which is the Zoe 703 the buttons are raised especially the power button you can hit them in your in your work bag or whatever accidentally hit them and then you rack up on site and the battery is flat so it's good to have it recess that screen even though it's tempered um, it's kind of raised a little bit they could have recessed it the Zoe uh, 703s is worse um, you can see it's kind of uh, convex and it's already scratched so I think it's good if they recess it I mean like my trusty fluke you can see they've recessed the screen shame they haven't taken that opportunity it would make the screen last a lot longer I'm sure now let's have a look at the sockets I know they're going to be split pin but actually they actually feel nice I mean, I've used these um, on the 2C23T, they're not being an issue. 
stand is very good, but I guess it's because of the shape of it. Power it up. Pretty slow to boot. But yeah, no, that's good. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. And it doesn't feel like that back stand's going to snap off anytime soon. It feels quite strong. So no real complaints with the construction or durability apart from not having that glass recessed. Now let's take a look at the spacing on the formulator jacks and what types of BNC you can accept. Remember the 23, sorry the 2C23T couldn't accept BNC jacks which are insulated. I do hope that it's not the case with this one. Let's um, get some of my insulated probes. Yay! Look at that! Oh, fantastic. Let's try another one. Let's try uh, Tektronics probe. Come on, you can do it. Yes! Fantastic! Thank you, Fenosi. Shit, shit! Oh, that's brilliant. That's great. Thank goodness for that. What a shame we haven't got a BNC connector, a similar one for the function generator output. Could have been so perfect. Now let's check for 90 millimeters. No, it's not 90 millimeters spaced. Ugh. It's like that in the 2C23T, the DMT99. I'm sure I'm sure there's space. If they just space those connectors a bit more, I'm sure they could have put them at a standard distance. What a shame. Another missed opportunity. Now let's compare the size. Now I've got the 80 megahertz. Uh, well, affectionately known as the brick, the Gucci Fix LG304, which uh, I'll have to do a review on sh shortly. Um, one of its competitors, I guess, is cheaper and it's got greater bandwidth. But you can see it's quite small in comparison. Let's see how it compares with the Zoe ZT703. Kind of the same thickness, kind of the same weight actually, very similar weight. My UDT UT61. Um, so you know, it's going to take up the same type of space in your bag. So, yeah, no, no more inconvenient than taking your standard multimeter. Try the DMT 90. Well, okay, the DMT 90 is actually a, quite a small multimeter, but yeah, it's more or less the same size. If you've got one of those and you want to know how it compares, a bit wider. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, an overview of the functionality. I'm not going to do a deep dive, I'm just going to cover the basic stuff so you can get a kind of initial look and feel for what the user interface is like. Um, so uh, you got these, uh, you got that um, bar graph at the top there. Dave Jones would like that. So you got multimeter, oscilloscope, um, signal generator, and settings. So you basically got those four top level menus which you can cycle through. Uh, quite a good selection of languages there. Um, brightness you can set to save battery. And you'll need to. <laughs> um, okay, you got uh, a couple of different colours, as themes as they call them. Uh, an option on what to boot up into, that's nice. Uh, so you can select that into your multimeter, if that's what you use the most. 
um, auto shut down again save your precious battery life um, a USB sharing so this is where you can kind of turn it into a USB drive for sharing your pictures and stuff and there's the software version remember I was telling you that, that you've got um, MCU version and uh, FBA so the 1.5 is for the MCU and the 1.4 is for the FPGA so uh, let's go into the multimeter um, yeah so we've got this uh, kind of analog graph I think they did that especially for Dave Jones from EV blog he loves that sort of stuff you see the indicators on the right um, corresponding to the input jacks you should use for the function you're on or gear as they call it so here's all the gears as they call it of functions um, you can see it shows you when you should be using the current input, the high current input or the milliamp input. Let's try milliamp. And you see there it shows you have to use the milliamp input. Well, that's pretty handy I guess if you're a novice. Hmm. Touch screen doesn't seem so responsive. Got there eventually. Hmm. It's not a good start. Okay. I mean, so you can see so you basically select your your basic functional gear from there, and like the DMT ninety nine, it's got kind of like this um, graphing function, and it also shows you a minimum maximum. Do note there's no indication of a relative function here. Uh, we'll look at that a bit closer when we do the functional review. That's a bit weird. It says the maximum is three microfarads. No way could it be. I haven't even got anything connected. Hmm. Let's see what it does in ohms. Well, that's weird. Let's be. Let me put in my um, resistance box, my precision attenuator, and play around with the graphical section, the graphings function. That's weird. It's saying maximum 1k, minimum minus 10k. How on earth does it determine that? Uh, because of that, you can see the graphing function is not moving much because it's sweeping between plus 1k and minus 10k, and it's just a 1k potentiometer. bit buggy well you see that's a good thing that I'm not going to do my performance review straight away I'll wait for a bit for the uh, bugs to be fixed there's another good reason for doing it later it's moving but not as much as you'd expect it to do if it was going between 0 and 1k And it doesn't actually have a millivolt range, even though it's got so many counts. It's a bit weird. But the accuracy doesn't justify that many counts, in my opinion. That's weird. Look at that. Maximum is millivolts, minimum is in ohms. Uh, yeah, okay. Clearly. How did this get through their test department? Did they actually test it? <laughs> that should have been picked up easily. Okay, now let's go over to the oscilloscope function. Sorry, the video quality is not so good. So at the top trace here, I've got a one kilohertz signal coming from the Gochi Fix brick on the left. And then uh, bottom trace, I've got a two kilohertz signal coming from the Zoe ZT703S. You can see channel 1 and channel 2 parameters up there. Uh, channel 2 is 500 millivolts division uh, times 10 probe. Um, you, can, you can actually increase the time base 
or reduce it by tapping on the right or the left. So tapping on the left increases it and tapping on the right reduces it. Pretty cool. You've got your auto set function at the bottom there. That was pretty good. That seemed to work quite well, quite fast. You can see the frequency there at the bottom. You probably can't read that. I do apologize. I should have uh, zoomed in a bit more for you. There we are. So you can just see it's 99 kilohertz for channel one. Um, and you can see you've got the channel one and channel two sub menu. You can switch it on and off. Switch it back on again. Hmm. I hope the issue here with the touchscreen is not a hardware one and can be fixed through software. And you got the probe, attenuation, coupling AC or DC, and then the bandwidth limit. And you got this this wheel thing for changing the vertical sensitivity. I'm not sure I really like that. Uh, channel two, the same of course. It's quite easy, quite intuitive to flick between channel one and channel two parameters. So auto again, let's get back to where we were. And you see how you can drag the waveforms, that's pretty cool. I've not actually used the touch screen scope before, um, but I'm liking this. And you've got the trigger menu, um, standard stuff, nothing to uh, write home about here, standard modes. And you can see how much of the memory you're using, the sample memory at the top there. You can see if we change the time base, it allocates more or less. This button switches on or switches off the function generator. And then we can, of course, pause the oscilloscope. Let's press auto again, gets back. Notice a spelling mistake, a funcation. What's a funcation? I don't know, but I like the sound of it. In measurement, you've got all the different types of measurement parameters for channel one and channel two. Quite a good selection there. We'll test those in detail when we do the functional review. But you get the idea about how you can toggle, toggle them on and off. What else is there? What else is what other functions we got? Save the waveform. I like that word, functation. Cursor, so you can do the, the x axis or the y axis. Okay, that's pretty good on a portable scope. A bit tricky to use, but looks functional. I guess. Uh, We'll test it a bit more in the next video. What other functions we got? I got a uh, cursor for Y. Calculations, a load of calculations, mathematical functions. And you get a third trace from the product of the mathematical function. I like that. So you can see they're a bit out of phase. So you can see the third waveform changing as the phase impacts on the uh, mathematical function. I do like that. That's a good function. It's pretty cool. What happens if I switch off channel 2? Okay, yeah, the mouse doesn't work, of course. Channel 1 times channel 2, see what that does. Okay. You can see you basically just toggle them on and off. 
so it's quite intuitive and easy to use. Oh, I like that one. It shows that you've got the third trace there as the, the product. That's pretty cool. I like that. I've got to think of a, a problem for this solution. That's pretty cool. Now we've got to try FFT, of course. Oh, is that it? Can you see um, up there? That's <laughs> that's the FFT. All right, uh, we've got some work to do in the next video to see what that's about, or it's any good. Award, it's just a gimmick. Hmm. I know it's, it's not even anything to set the type of FFT either. Not sure how useful that is. I know what these other mathematical functions are. What's that? Well, anyway, you, you get the idea. I think that's quite cool. And then we got uh, afterglow, which I guess is persistence. Uh, so infinite. That could actually be quite useful. And you're trying to average things. You got one second or infinite. There's a one second persistence or afterglow. And we got XY. What I would like to do in the next video actually is is try putting a a curve tracer on this. Yeah, you know, where you show the I versus V to show the properties of a component. Correction, okay, that's calibration. Okay. Good. Uh, image, uh, that's recalling saved images. 50%. Um, okay. That will probably put the two traces at the 50% show the screen. Yeah, that's, that's like what it does. And course and fine, that just sets. Um, the steps, if you like, for moving waveforms around, whether they move in small steps or large steps. Any other functions? I think that's about it. Oh, it's so unfortunate they misspelt it on the hardware. Oh dear, oh dear, that was probably a Friday afternoon job. Well, I think that's pretty much for the oscilloscope. Um, this is for a look at the signal generator. So we've got sine wave, square wave, sawtooth, half wave, full wave, step wave, reverse step wave, direct current, that's handy. Index up, index decrease, multi audio, what on earth is that? And sync pulse. Hmm. Okay, and then. Okay, we can enter parameters directly through the keyboard. That's nice. I like that. Uh, that's good. Pretty intuitive to use. Now I've got uh, an adapter from BNC to the horrible MCX and then I've got that plugged into 
a competitor device so that we can see what sort of uh, waveforms we get out. And the competitor is the Zoe ZT703S, another 50 megahertz multifunction device. Quite a lot of reviews on this already, actually. It's probably not really doing a, a direct review on this anymore. So many reviews out there. Maybe I'll do a comparative review. Okay, so uh, this is the half wave, sine wave, square, sawtooth, full wave. I've got an AC couple, you can see it moving. Step wave, kind of jittering a bit. So, uh, direct current, index up. Let's decrease. Multi audio, we'll probably have to listen to that one and sync pulse, wherever that is. Okay, should I change in the amplitude? Yes, easy to use. What a shame it hasn't got a BNC output. Right, so I think it'd be quite usable. I don't know if you've seen the um, signal generator or function generator on the Zoe ZT703S. It's pretty awful. Um, so this is refreshingly good. Now we have to do the continuity test, of course. What sort of a review would it be if we didn't do that? So. Oh, it's latching. It's pretty good. It's quite fast. That's good. No complaints there. And then, of course, we should make sure that the multimeter section is isolated from the USB section. So that's good. Uh, so it's open circuit between the multimeter and the oscilloscope. Uh, let's try between the USB and multimeters isolated. That's good. But I expect that the oscilloscope is connected to the USB or power circuit. Yeah, it's not isolated. Okay. So be warned. Um, you've got a direct connection between your oscilloscope circuit and your power circuit. Now, everybody's favorite bit, let's uh, take this thing apart. Yes, here we go. Oh, there's a lot going on in there. Not one, but three PCBs. Look at that multimeter PCB on the left, main board, nice shielding, uh, and then on the right we've got a little power PCB, huge battery, uh, 4000 milliamp hours. Mm, there's quite a lot going on in there. Let's get rid of the battery and have a look. Okay. Okay, what have we got? I was expecting one PCB. Not three. This. Okay, so we've got the USB input and you see your power management IC, probably your battery charging IC. Um, and then we've got the main board there. I can see the big FPGA and the multimeter. I think that's the same as used in the 2C23T and DMT99 short years. Oh no, 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 no. Soldered in microfuses. Oh, Finercy, why? Why have you done that? Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm a bit put off now. 
can't believe that they've done that. All right, well, let's take this thing apart. We're going to have to do a next level teardown now. And take these boards out. There we are, I've completely broken it. So uh, there's the display with touch screen, and power board, main board, so we've got the MCU on the back. And of course then we've got the back panel with the, the battery. So let's have a look at each item. Let's start off with a multimeter board. So what we got here? Now that device, the SD seven five zero two. Yeah, that's the same one used in the two C twenty three T and the DMT. 99. Uh, so here's the data sheet for it. Well, that's actually for the 7501, but yeah, I can imagine the 7502 is similar. Uh, more counts. And we got some uh, MILF resistors. Sorry, MELF resistors. These microfuses. Oh, why did they do that? Only 250 volt rated as well, I'm sure. Oh, what, what a letdown. That's a backward step. Uh, that's a current shunt, I guess. Um, we got DC to DC isolator. I like how they've actually indicated all these test points, etc. That's uh, maintenance friendly. I like that. So we've got okay. So we've got kind of a bridge effect fire arrangement as a suppre suppression for the current input. Um, if you want to look at the suppression devices and how they work in a multimeter and protection devices, have a look at my functional sorry my um, hardware review of the two C twenty three T. I've gone into it in quite some detail about the protection devices you'd expect to see in a multimeter. So you've got um, range switching relay there. Um, what else we got? So Q5 and Q6 is uh, configured as a bipolar ZR. There's a PTC. Well, at least we got a PTC. That's something. No MOVs, of course. Uh, what's this? This would be more isolation devices, probably for data. Yeah, that's what they will be. You probably got one for data, one for the signal for the for the sounder for the continuity test. Because I know that's on the main board. That current shunt looks pretty awful. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it performs in our functional performance test. Then we've got the power board. Uh, it's got the reset switch on there as well, and the uh, power switch. Um, what's that power chip there? I don't recognise that. Let's bring out the data sheet IP530 
six. Okay, this looks like a high pa higher power um, charging charge management IC 2.1 amps and 2.4 amps discharge. Shame they haven't got um, fast charging and PD capability for USB C. The unpopulated LED, why is that? There's a reset switch there at the bottom. Nothing going on in the back. And then on the um, front panel with the touchscreen display, you'll see that you've got the touchscreen interface IC embedded in the flexible PCB. So for those of you interested, I'm not, but there's the details for you. Now uh, here's the interesting bit, the main board. Huge uh, FPGA. Oh, I like the um, the length compensated tracks there, you can see. That's good design, that's nice to see. And then uh, MXT2088 uh, ADC. So this is actually 100 mega samples. So how are they claiming 250 mega samples? And it's uh, compatible with the AD9288, which is used in all the Rigol scopes in the past. Very common. But can't be 250 mega samples unless it overclocking it. Well, let's we'll try that later. We'll test it out. It's a display connector. Uh, nice shielding. Uh, how many megahertz crystals that drive in the FPGA? 25 megahertz. Okay, that's quite respectable. I do like how they um, share what the pinouts are on the PCB. That's maintenance friendly. I like that. What have we got on the bottom? Okay, got uh, 74HC4053, so that would be an uh, analog multiplexer. That would probably be for attenuating the signal generator output. And then we've got this op amp, 8092, uh, 350 MHz op amp. They use this on the 2C23T also, or a variant of it, same family. So it's a signal generator output. Should really check the output impedance of that really. I bet it's not 50 ohms. Well, it might be. So there's our BNC inputs. Uh, power management. The thing about FPGAs, they require a lot of power rails. So it's probably why the power section is so complicated. They're not so easy to drive from a power point of view. Some more labeled test points, that's nice. And this must be the microcontroller. Lasered off. Hey, actually, the lasering's not very good, you know. They've not done a very good job at hiding that. Kind of flirting with us on what that is. That's almost readable. Almost. Maybe with a bit of effort. Come back to that. Uh, not much else on the bottom, really. Uh, okay, we got the SBI flash memory down there. It's 128 megabit. We're storing our configuration. Maybe it's also storing downloaded software. What else have we got? I do like this metal can. Look, it's on little clips, so it's removable rather than being soldered in. That's a nice touch. And I also like the uh, fully metal BNC jacks. I do like that. I don't know, it's quite well put together. Okay, I'm going to try and take this off. I have to be careful not to damage any tracks.
Okay, what we got? Well, this circuitry looks almost identical for the components from the 2C23T. Compensation capacitor there. Um, analog multiplexer for range switching, attenuation. There's that op amp again, that 350 megahertz dual op amp. Uh, this would be a solid state switch to switch in and out that capacitor on the right to select AC or DC coupling. Another multiplexer. Another 350 megahertz op amp. Uh, that's pretty much it. Nothing to write home about. I notice there's no shielding between the two channels. That's interesting. I would have expected that. Hmm. Okay, well, I think we're just about done here. What's that? Um, oh, that would be the the buzzer. That would have to be connected through to the multimeter board somehow, through some sort of isolator. But it's quite neat. Shame they couldn't get everything on one board. But I guess uh, just out of space. Let's see if we can do a reveal on this microprocessor or microcontroller. I'm rubbing it with a bit of alcohol, one of those uh, alcohol wipes. Let's see. Oh, I think I can read a bit more. I don't know about you at home, whether you can see that. I'm starting to see some numbers coming through. So S W S Y N W I T. Not sure. Okay, so we I did manage to find out what it was. It's a SWM three four SR E T six MPU, uh, ARM Cortex M three three, and then of course we got the A to D, which is the M X T two zero eight eight, which is a A D nine two eight eight clone. Connects to the Analogic FPGA, running at 25 megahertz. Um, and then in the multimeter section, we've got the uh, ST7502. Um, and that's within the completely isolated multimeter section. Um, and then what have we got? We've got the power management IC, which is the IP5306. Let's check the um, current consumption. My goodness, that's a lot of juice. 0.7 of an amp. My goodness. I'm just going to put it to multimeter mode. It's still 680. My goodness. So, we got a 4000 milliamp hour battery and we're taking 670 milliamps that's going to last us about 5.9 in favorable winds so that's probably what five hours mm. now as promised I'm going to do a quick bandwidth test uh, so I'm going to start off with one megahertz I've got it connected via 50 ohm terminator and it was shared with a 200 megahertz scope there for reference same termination technique uh, so, say so starting off at one megahertz. Sorry about the the camera work. I'm holding this by hand. So you can see, you've got one megahertz, uh, two volts peak to peak. So we're going to drop that to 1.4 volts peak to peak. That's minus 3 dB or 0 0.0707. So we go to 10 megahertz. It's looking good. Oh, look at that. Hmm. Hopefully. See, the 200 megahertz scope is fine. Hopefully pressing auto will fix that. Let's see. 
Okay, that's better. Let's press Alto on the desktop scope. Okay, so we're at 20 megahertz now. Still looking okay. 30, 38, 40. Well, it's doing well. We're at 40 and it's only dropped to 1.7. Remember, we're looking to get to 1.4. There's a bandwidth limit. Trace is starting to wobble a bit. 46. Okay, there we are. 1.4. So 47. Well, that's not too bad. You know, maybe I'm not terminated it in the best way that I could. Let's try switching on the second trace, see if it makes a difference. It's dropped to 1.28, 1 1.35, it's not much of a difference. But I do have a bit of a wobbly trace there. Okay, and let's do square wave. What I found out that, that I'll save you time, basically, is it works up to 10 megahertz, more or less. And then after that, it just goes bonkers. This is as expected. Now, if you recall, the um, analog to digital converter that is uh, used on the board is actually a 100 mega sample uh, dual uh, ADC. So how on earth is 250 mega samples being quoted? I can imagine 200 mega samples because you've got 100 mega samples for each ADC within the package. So um, I want to um, measure the actual clock um, used for these two ADCs. So you can see we've referenced this diagram. Now I know this is not the actual device that's used, but the device that's being used is a clone of this, and this one is in English, so I'm referring to this one. So pin 14 and pin 47 are the clock inputs. Pin 14 is most accessible, so this is for channel B. So I'm going to measure the uh, actual clock frequency for channel B on pin 14. So I set the time base to the fastest, 10 nanoseconds. Both traces on, channel 1 and channel 2. So I just get my probe on the channel B clock. And now uh, that's a surprise, 156.25 megahertz. Why on earth is that? If, if any of you are experts in the use of a, uh, ADCs and know why this might be, um, let me know. But to me, it simply looks like a case of severe overclocking. Could it really be overclocked by that much? Um, and even if it was, uh, that's that's a lot higher than um, 250 mega samples when both channels are combined. I mean, if it's 156, what's that? That's 312 mega samples. So, what do you think? Let me know in the comments if you've got some ideas on this. Would love to to get your feedback on this one. And um, when we do the functional review, perhaps we can look in more detail at its performance and see if the performance corresponds to a clock frequency of 156 megahertz. Now, before I conclude this review, I'd like to get your feedback on how we're going to do the next video, the functional and performance review. So I have a Gochi Fix 80 megahertz uh, multifunction device, um, and I also have uh, a Zoe Z. 703s which is another 50 megahertz device so do you think I should do a uh, review just upon the Finerci uh, 2C53P or would you rather I do a comparative one and see how the functionality of the 2C53P compares with the Gochi Fix and the Zoe devices so let me know in the comments and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Now let's have a look at the, the cons. So first of all, um, I'm really disappointed that they've used the MCX connector for the signal generator. Um, as I was mentioning before, uh, we saw them on the DSO TC3 and they're just not durable. It's not something you want on a portable device. I think they're right connecting PCB to PCB within uh, equipment enclosure or something like that, but not for a portable device. So that's quite a big letdown. The other one, which is a real surprise, um, is uh, fuses being soldered to the PCB. I can't imagine what Venersi were thinking when they did that. It seems such a, a step backwards uh, from the 2C23T. Um, so it's clearly not a serious attempt at producing a multimeter. It's, it's more like a an add-on, almost like an afterthought to add it on to a portable oscilloscope. So that's quite disappointing. The inputs are not cat rated, but then you could take that as being um, kind of an honest approach. Uh, there are many manufacturers out there which would say they're cat rated when they're they're not. So I wouldn't recommend using the the multimeter inputs for main use. Um, of course, not for high energy. This is really just for kind of uh, hobbyist electronics. Um, which of course this uh, this device would be aimed at. Non-standard spacing between the four meter input jacks, not really a showstopper, more annoying than anything else. Um, software updates provided as two separate firmware files for the MPU and FPGA. I don't like this, it's, it's potentially risky. Normally you would have a package which could combine all your software components. Um, to reduce the risk of then the two components being out of sync, i.e. one installed but not the other. Um, so I'm surprised there's not some sort of container or package to control that. And it just puts more risk in the user getting their software updates wrong. Um, so I, I do hope they change that. The ADC appears to be overclocked. Um, I say appears to be, um, I, I don't see how that could be misinterpreted from the measurements we did. But we'll take a closer look at that when we do the performance review. Another negative is the uh, high current consumption. Um, it's really high, isn't it? Over 600 milliamps, actually more like 650 milliamps. So the uh, runtime is only going to be around five hours or so. But then it's, yeah, it's generally quite a high performance device and you've got a large screen. so. Um, it doesn't support fast charging. That's a bit disappointing given that it's got a big battery to charge. This would somewhat compensate for the high current consumption if you did have that. But to have high cons current consumption and not have fast charging, it could be a bit of a problem. And then price. It's in a difficult place actually because it's uh, expensive to the point where pay a little bit more, you could have a Hantec bench scope, which are pretty good um, and offer a lot more features and performance than this does. Okay, you've got portability, but then if you want that, then there's other devices on the market with um, more bandwidth um, at a lower price. So it's in a difficult position in the market I don't know how well this is going to sell. It remains to be seen. Now on to the pros. So I love the large and bright touchscreen um, and I like the resolution with it as well. Uh, I think that it renders waveforms um, pretty much like a bench scope. It looks really nice. Um, and I look forward to using it a bit more. And it's been fun to use with a touchscreen, to be honest, it's a first touchscreen based scope device that I've used um, and I'm, I'm quite enjoying it if I was to be honest but let's see how it works out from uh, real use. I like the tempered glass screen I think that's a great idea um, and thoughtful uh, but I just wish it was recessed. The FPGA based acquisition and storage is a, is a great point. Um, although it is becoming more commonplace with these scope meters these days. I like the 
the detail got into the design of the main board um, and the shielding section and all metal BNC input jacks. Um, and I like the option to boot the multimeter, that's great. But it does have a high capacity battery to compensate for the high current consumption. So I think that pretty much concludes this uh, hardware review and teardown. Um, there's still a long way to go in terms of functionality to test and maybe that will make up for the disappointments in the hardware design. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments and uh, do let me know what you'd like to see in the functional and performance review. And as always, if you found this video entertaining and useful, please do subscribe or give me a like. It does help me with my channel and help me make more content like this. And until next time, take care and look after yourselves.